we are all coming at this from different places and, and different spaces of inclusion and different understandings of faith and what it means. And so I'm just really grateful that all of you chose to be here today from whatever place or space you're coming from and from whatever gaps that need to be filled and whatever barriers need to come down. Thank you for being part of this. Um, <clears throat> I want to just share with you a little story at the very beginning. This painting, this very weird thing here, was done for me by a woman who paints something called the Lion of Judah. And she is a fundamentalist, prophetic artist. And um, we have this friendship in Abilene. We couldn't be more distant from one another theologically. And that's just the truth. And yet, we get to have dialogue pretty much every week and have become friends. I know that in her heart, she's confident our friendship will lead me to a better place. And I know in my heart, I'm confident that my friendship with her will lead her to a better place. This, this is where we are. But she did this for me last week because I agreed to carry a copy of her painting the Lion of Judah to President Obama when I went to the prayer breakfast. And she was confident that painting, if it could just get into the White House, would of course heal our country. So she has her belief. I did carry it, and then she came back and did this painting and said, I thought you needed a painting that represented all of the personalities I see in you. I'd like for you to notice especially this one. <laughs> I don't know what that means yet, but I know it's going to give us enough conversation. We can talk for several more years together, and that'll be a good thing. That is why we all do this work, right? To be able to have one conversation with one other person about our journey on this whole process. There's nothing else more important. You know, in the gay movement, we always say coming out is an act of love. Just come out. And I believe the same thing is true for all of us, whatever place we're in on our faith journey. We have to just come out about what we believe about this issue to one other human being who loves us, trusts us, or at least thinks we're okay. That's the conversation. I want to use that as a precursor to this little pamphlet that we brought. The author is here, Haven Perrin, right here Haven. Haven is the Director of Development for Soul Force and our newest uh, senior staffer, Deputy Director of Soul Force now, wrote this and uh, it's the follow-on piece to Reverend Mel White's piece that has been distributed by the thousands about the Bible and homosexuality. So I hope you'll enjoy that. Today I had an assignment and it is to um, walk you through some of the newer ways or different ways that people are doing the kind of work that we all do in the world. So I want to start with uh, a little bit about our organization. We started in 1998 by Reverend Mel White and his partner Gary Nixon and the Soul Force Equality Ride, which is our largest program, began then in 2006. Haven was the co-facilitator, leader, director of the Equality Ride at that time. Who in here knows what the equality right is? Good, okay. So um, I just want to say for me, what an incredible honor it is to work with Haven. When we were at Focus on the Family this last year, you know, the equality writers have always been arrested at Focus on the Family. And I was standing in front waiting because we were going to get in. We were not going to be arrested. We've been invited in for a day of dialogue. And the, and the bus, the Equality Ride bus, pulled up into a circular drive at Focus on the Family, and I just burst into tears. And I wasn't part of the ride. <laughs> you know, I, and I was, wasn't on the bus. I didn't do any of that work. Uh, Haven and Mel and other people did all of that work. But it pulled up and the door opened and these young, brilliant, wonderful people stepped out and Focus on the Family opened their door. And I thought, well, if that's not a metaphor for this work, I, I don't know what it is. So I, I invite you, if you have time, go to YouTube sometime 
and just watch Equality Ride videos. Because um, it just blesses my heart. Just put in Soul Force Equality Ride and watch one or two, and it will encourage you in the work that you're doing uh, here. Our work is relentless nonviolent resistance to the stigma and the oppression that arises primarily out of religion based beliefs about sexual and gender minorities, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender people, as well as women and other people who are subjugated and violated under the things that patriarchy and fundamentalism sanction in the church. We visit a lot of colleges and universities, 106, 104 now of the 211 affiliated institutions for the Council of Christian Churches, uh, Colleges and Universities. And those are those that identify as being distinctively Christian and they sign an affiliation agreement. And in that are statements that you cannot have sex outside of heterosexual marriage, for example. In addition to that, we uh, go to places that are international now in scope that create and control messaging going out over all the airwaves, the internet, shortwave, cable, television, including places like Focus on the Family and the National Religious Broadcasters. We visit military training sites. Thank God we don't have to go to so many of those anymore. That's a wonderful thing. Denominational headquarters and conventions. And in the past, as you probably know, they have typically arrested us. That has sort of been the thing that happened with Soul Force. It's an interesting thing to go from a place where people arrest you, usually for singing hymns. <laughs> and that's the major destructive act that we did. It's very interesting to go from that place to a place where people are opening the door. Sometimes they're opening the door because they figured out a strategy. You know, their PR leaders have said, let them in. They get more television coverage when we arrest them than they don't. Whatever the strategy, though, for me, and this is just for me, it's not an official soul force credo, but for me, that is the movement of spirit. Whatever their motivation is, if we get in the door, then we get to sit down, then we get to talk. And that is what we're in the business to do. If you look at activism, it's played a major role around the world in ending slavery in a lot of places, challenging dictatorships, protecting workers from exploitation, protecting the environment, promoting equality for women, opposing racism, deconstructing patriarchy in the church, and opening the doors of the military to sexual and gender minorities. Yet, there is very little research on social movements to tell us what we actually do and how we can do it better. My assignment for today was to try and help look at some ways to do even more of what you do and any systemic improvements we can figure out that'll, that'll help that work better. The good news is the little bit of research that there is says activism is actually expanding worldwide. It is becoming much more sophisticated. We are learning from one another. We're being inspired by one another. The amount of information about activism available to us is dramatically increasing because of the internet. We're more aware, we're better educated, and guess what? We are less acquiescent to authority. Now whether you see that as a good thing or a bad thing, all the sociology in the world says we're just less acquiescent. You know this is true, right? Isn't there some institution or something that you used to say, yes, yes, whatever you did, and now you're like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> okay? Because we're less acquiescent, we're better able to judge now when systems aren't working and we're more willing to change them. Young adults are not, contrary to some of the publications coming out from the very extreme right, are not actually less engaged than those of us who are less young. They are engaged in very different ways. If we want to work in an intergenerational context 
And if we don't, I would ask you, then what? Because those of us who are over 50 are all headed somewhere. If we're not going to do that, I, I don't know what to talk to you, so I could go home. But uh, we have to embrace somehow digital activism, because that's the way the whole world is connected now. Now, just in case there's anyone in the room who says, I don't do Twitter, I don't do Facebook, I don't do that, I don't like it, I'm not going to. I do not eat green eggs and ham. I will not say my, okay, so whatever it is, I want to share with you that the very famous author, Malcolm Gladwell, in his recent article in New, York, or New Yorker, did indeed ridicule all of today's digitally mediated tactics as being substantively inferior to the offline high-risk strong tie tactics of the civil rights movement. In one of his passages, he says, enthusiasts for social media would no doubt have us believe that King's task in Birmingham would have been infinitely easier had he been able to communicate with his followers through and contented himself with tweets from the Birmingham jail. <laughs> Gladwell's, I call this uh, digital absolutism, ignores the true hybridity of digital activism. It's often mixed with offline tactics. Soulforce does this every single, we're doing it right now. Are you Twittering right now? <laughs> we're doing it right now. We're Hashtag sitting here. Cindy Love Speak. There you go. We're with you face to face. We're doing this and we're telling our consumers, our followers, this is what's happening. However, when Gladwell writes that King's task would have been infinitely easier had he been able to communicate through Facebook, I actually believe he's right. How much faster could things have gone if those eight letters could have been 8,000, 800,000? Would we? May I dare to suggest? would we not still be so stuck in the racism of today if we'd had those powerful tools then and been able to engage a younger generation quickly? We don't know. But I sure would have been willing to try it as a strategy. I think, he says, Martin Luther King would have tweeted though not to the exclusion of all other tactics as Gladwell implies. This is a both and, not an either or. In fact, he says, I can think of little reason why, this is actually she, sorry, he's writing this, why King, a great believer in the power of the public word, would not have used every tool at his disposal. If you were unfortunate enough to ever hear me preach, you would have heard me say, as I say it in every sermon, when Jesus said, go ye into all the world and preach, give the good news to all people, I believe he knew that we would have this day. He knew we would have the digital platforms whereby that was possible. He knew that even in countries where there is no internet, there is shortwave radio. He knew we could get there. So the goal that was set was, in fact, not impossible, but possible. Now, of course, we get into the realm of counterfactuals. If only there was a major recent civil rights case we could somehow use to test whether civil rights activists would use social media, would King have done it, if he had a choice. And there is such a case. We have it right now, the campaign to demand justice for Trayvon Martin. It's going to be the first business case of this time. It shows the true hybridity of activism. Traditionally, offline strong tie networks like the Civil Rights Movement collaborate with new online weak tie networks, those members who are connected by Twitter, Facebook, and change.org. The two more successful tactics of the Trayvon case, the Million Hoodie March and the Change.org peti petition, which had two million signatures on this date, and that's now grown were either digital or hybrid and were created by people with weak ties, or you could argue no ties, to Trayvon's family. The reality is that both offline and online are often needed to attack injustice, and the two are not as clearly 
demarcated as we think. A blogger named Daniel Marie, or Mari, organized the Million Hoodie March in New York using an online tool, Facebook, in order to drive online action, signing a change.org petition, which called for the prosecution of Trayvon's killer. Trayvon's parents and the civil rights leaders that advised them did not initiate those actions, nor did they adopt them. Yeah. I'm sorry, but they did adopt them. They took over the change.org petition, which was originally started by a lawyer. They adopted the hoodie symbol developed by his colleagues, and they didn't adopt those because they were enthusiasts for social media. In fact, they said, what? I don't know, I don't even do that. I don't know what you're talking about. But the good news is this isn't rocket science. This is something even I, 58 years old, dragging close to the grave, can do. <laughs> <laughs> I hear that at my church, so I'm just sharing that with you. <laughs> they adopted them because they worked, because the change.org petition became the focal point of the national outrage. The hoodie symbol became a transcendent means of motivating and expressing solidarity. The online-offline dichotomy presented by Gladwell was and is suspect in spite of the fact it was in the New Yorker. The dichotomy of strong tie, weak tie is also false. We no longer have to know all of the points of contact to get people to play. And savvy strategists will use whatever tools and tactics are available to them and they will mix them at will. That's the question. So today we're going to talk about, think about, how can we facilitate the network of people here and everywhere into a collective voice of action? Now I have been staying with my delightful host who told me about the day they started wearing their rainbow ribbons at church and put the brochures in the um, pews and you know all these things. And there are, of course, people in their church, I suspect, who said, why are you doing this? And I would rather you didn't. At least one, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I suspect. All right. How do you, when people decide we're going to step up and step out in behalf of someone who's experiencing injustice, then how do we increase that collective action? And I would love to see us accelerate the adoption curve of that. That it wouldn't take us 40 years every time we introduced a new idea, like more tea. It wouldn't take us 40 years to get to the place we could say, oh, we now have tea fully manifest. <laughs> Duh. Okay. I would like for us to be able to expand and diversify our local population bases for activism. Why? Because it can't all be digital. It also has to be hands-on. People have to show up and to do stuff together. And three, how do we amplify our voice in policy issues within the church universal and in the broader community? That's kind of the three goals. So we're going to look at two methods or tools today. One is called pop-ups and flash mobs, which are part of digital activism. They are not, by the way, new, which I'm going to show you, but they're going to be new to us probably. And then, before we go there, create a context for digital activism. How many of you were around on January 1st, 1994, when NAFTA was scheduled for implementation in Mexico? If you weren't here, you're entirely too young. Yeah. <laughs> so, the intent, remember, was for Mexico to become a powerful symbol of globalization, to be integrated into the economic network of developed nations. Remember the ads that ran across the television? All the colors. But what happened? The Zapatistas occupied seven towns that day in Chiapas, and the internet exposed the underbelly the severe oppression of the indigenous people in a neglected Mexican state. And a strategy that would have basically been genocide in that area, sanctioned by the state. 
But what happened? Websites with up-to-the-hour postings went along with bulletin boards for postings and listservs were used and there were massive emails and fax campaigns to news media and consulates. Historians now believe this attention prevented genocide as a military solution in that place. 1994. Fast forward. Iran. 2009. A young female protester was captured on video, uploaded and viewed by millions. In the height of that uproar, more than 221,000 Iran tweets were sent in just one hour. In one day, 3,000 Iranian videos were uploaded on YouTube. 2.2 million blog entries were posted. The young woman named Nada or Nida had become the cause. And social media, not traditional outlets, provided the megaphone. In fact, had they been all localized at that point, they would have killed the people, right? So in this case, it allowed something to happen without having death on the ground. These events demonstrate what I think happens when people rally or gather resources for a cause using digital platforms. And now, thank goodness, 2013, there are these incredibly sophisticated tools that you can use to achieve that. But at the same time, people still have to meet people and enter into dialogue to make a real difference. Changing hearts and minds is a complex call on our hearts. There's not really any other way. Let's look at two more. My favorite story is the Sneetches. Who knows the story of the Sneetches? Okay. Some people don't know that story. So neglected. Hey, man. <laughs> Sneeches are like human beings who lived on beaches. A guy came along who was a really smart marketer. He put a star on the belly of one Sneech and pronounced to the world that if you didn't have a star on your belly, you weren't cool. He then set up a pop-up shop on the beach, a temporary location to attract people to a consumer product which has a short sales cycle. And he pitched it to him. Come through my magic machine, I'll put a star on your belly and you too will be cool. So the Sneetches lined up, as humans do, all to get stars implanted on their bellies. And as soon as he had sold the star to every person, every Sneetch on the beach, he then pronounced that stars were no longer cool. And all the Sneetches would have to progress back through his magical machine to have the stars removed. This afternoon we'll talk about this in terms of stigma. But for the example today, it's important to understand that this pop-up shop is like a retail space for consumer products. That's how it's been used. You've seen them Halloween stores, Christmas stores, <coughs> closeout stores where they put all this stuff and they're selling it out quick, getting out of the way, and then in a few weeks the store's gone. The concept actually started in the UK. How can we use this concept with activism for justice? I think the Soul Force Equality Ride has been a pop-up shop for the last six years. A bus appears in a community with some advance warning. We write the school, say we're coming. They say we don't want you. We say we understand. We're coming anyway. All right? We're branded, we have this wrap that goes all around the bus and tells everybody who we are. And then we arrive at a location which has to be temporary, sometimes because we can't permit, sometimes they won't let us stay, sometimes they arrest us, or sometimes there's no place to park. Temporary. And our sales team, these marvelous riders, step out, and tell the consumers, we want to talk to you about this amazing product we have that's called Freedom. You want to talk to us? Come on over. I think really it's been this all along. We just never thought of it in this context. Haven has this new cool idea too to do something called a social justice caravan, which is smaller than the big bus, 
that would actually be airstream tra airstream trailers that are wrapped, and they would go to shorter distances, but then set up shop for like four weeks in a community. So just imagine for a moment, one of them comes to Ann Arbor, you've got some folks who know they're coming, and the whole idea is for there to be resourcing and conversations and performance art and invitations over for, I don't know what, coffee, tea, I don't know, canopy, whatever it is. But the idea that then you have this support resource there for four weeks to help engage your local community. You know, I personally would love it if they parked on the parking lot of my childhood church in Abilene, Texas. That would just do my heart so much good. Now, the likelihood of them letting them stay is not good. It's really not good. But I thought about it, and if we had it right in the middle of the Abilene Christian University Lectureship Series, which brings 12,000 people from around the world to hear the gospel at Abilene Christian, and we had our own gospel choir that appeared in front of the Airstream trailer and handed out hot chocolate because it's always cold. I mean, I'm just, you know, you can go anywhere with this. But that's the concept of how do you use a pop-up thing to raise attention very rapidly, to engage a group of people who otherwise wouldn't engage, and then go away. If I ask you to give me examples right now of experiences you've had like that, as children even, you know what they are. Carnivals, <coughs> right? Petting zoos. How many people lined up ever go to a petting zoo? Really? So you can rub a sheep, you know? <laughs> but I mean, my parents paid good money for this. So that's the concept. Now, two examples, and we don't actually know if this is workable. I don't think it is workable. Because I can't click on that. Um, you want to come help me technically? Yes, I think, uh, I like that I, I mean, I don't really know what I'm doing, but I always act like I do. <laughs> so <laughs> that's what I get to do stuff like that. <laughs> we can copy we it. We can copy it. it and then fancy schmancy, we will paste it. Yeah. And then where's your browser? Oh, yeah. right there. Making magic. <laughs> Boom. Would you like to work in Abilene? No. I'm gonna stay at this No recruiting allowed. <laughs> okay, so um do we have speakers? Oh, yeah. Yep. Or should we put the microphone up against it? There you go. Uh, Turn up the speakers on the computer. <laughs>
Lieutenant. Yes, I. This morning here, we have, uh, through the guidelines of the college, I'll let uh, Mr. Olo here, who's the uh, administrator, administrator of the uh, campus here, um, profess what his uh, guidelines will be when it comes upon uh, entering the college campus here. Mr. Olo? Um, and when you cross the, uh, the street, um, you will notice that we've mar clearly marked the property line. And today, um, April 12, 2007, uh, the campus is uh, only open to students, to faculty, to staff, and to invited guests. Um, your group today has been expressly not invited to come onto campus. And so the property line is your boundary. If you do cross the property line, um, we have instructed the police to enforce the law against trespassing. And our ultimate goal is to have a conversation with our peers. We're here at Patrick Henry today, where there are many future leaders of this nation. And as our peers, we want to discuss our lives as gay and transgender people. Right now, Patrick Henry has joined the ranks of many schools on our route. This is our 12th stop that have chosen to disallow us onto campus. They let us know that there's no room for dialogue. And the reality is that that decision is made out of fear. They do not want me, as a gay Christian, to come onto campus and say, the paradigm is wrong. I can be Christian and gay. I am Christian and gay. And because of that, they've chosen instead to have us met with a large body of law enforcement. But we are here keeping integrity and, and relentlessness to our goal of speaking with students at Patrick Henry College who are possibly gay. And if they're not, they know someone who is. a child of God, a follower of Christ, I am a Christian and a lesbian. It's very important for me to be here today because the students of Patrick Henry College will be my future co-workers. I will work alongside of them in the arena of politics and social justice I think as well. it is very important that they have the opportunity to talk to gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender individuals. These people in which they will engage in dialogue, conversation, and will maybe represent Patrick one day. Henry College has decided that this conversation is not important. They have deemed us unworthy to join them at God's table. We have been told that we are uninvited guests, but we are here to invite the Patrick Henry community to open dialogue. We will be having a dinner, community, community dinner tonight uh, at White Palace Restaurant at 7 p.m. where all of the PHC community are invited. What about the administration's offer to me? Um, because I was told that the average student have to take care of today in a corner at another location. Um, yes, it did offer us a debate, but it was off campus um, with less access to students, and it was also on a debate on the federal marriage um, amendment, which is not what we're here to speak about. We're here to reconcile being gay and being Christian, and that has nothing to do with the federal marriage um, discussion, debate, and we're not here to debate, we're going to have, you know, dialogue with students. Yeah. And human rights should not be a debate. I think it's very clear that every human has inalienable rights, rights that every person is born with, and that's life, liberty, as the school's motto is, and also the right to happiness and pursue that as they see fit. And so that is not what we see as a debate. That should be a discussion, that should be a conversation.
pop-up shop was the bus, right? And all the people on the bus, the message on the bus. They couldn't get it on campus. They couldn't have a conversation on campus. So they created this really wonderful alternative, come have dinner with us, all right? The school basically shut down the possibility of students doing that. But we talk about nonviolence being relentless. And relentless, sometimes people think, they associate relentless sort of with mean or aggressive or pushy or, to me, relentless is all about creative. If you can't get in this door this way, you know, what's that thing from our childhood? If you can't go, so you can remember uh, prepositions, right? If you can't go under it, go over it. If you can't go around it, go, you know, that one. That's what relentless is about, is trying to figure out the next creative way to do this. I am convicted because of the experience with the ride, that if it were possible to have a flexible temporary location that popped up in a number of the places around the country where these issues are converging, where you could actually have some folks who are able to have those kinds of conversations and have them uh, have a potluck meal at your church that evening where people could come and gather, that then we could actually make substantive progress around these issues within our faith communities. We go to these colleges because they're the next um, they're the next generation of thought leaders. So that's where we have to be. Right, give me just a moment to go back here. What is the core issue you have to address as a church around the issue of being gay and Christian. I try and boil it down to one thing. Whether your church believes in the uh, scripture being inerrant and infallible, or whether you use a whole lot of other language, but inside people are still struggling. They're only struggling with two things, either this idea of inerrancy or infallibility of scripture, which simply means they don't want to do any deeper theology, and they don't care what Leviticus says, or they're scared to death of sex. And so this afternoon, I'm going to be talking about sex, stigma, and spirit for that very reason, because that's actually what's happening. People don't want to talk about sex. It doesn't matter if they're heterosexual, homosexual, trans, or whatever they are. They don't want to do it. And so we have to figure out a way to help people talk about that, and that will then help our community. The second thing in dealing with people who are fundamentalist evangelical, particularly around the issue of gay folk, is we have to be able to get to the point of having a conversation of whether the Holy Spirit is still revealing truth. Because the Holy Spirit is still present in the world. You can't talk to a fundamentalist otherwise, and I was one, unless you can convict me of the fact that the Holy Spirit is still working within our lives. You know, God is still speaking. Whatever you want to call it, there's got to be a place for that. So I, I give you those two things to think about um, your approaches here locally. I'm going to do this this afternoon. So I want to go to the final sort of concept, this concept of flash mobs. Anybody here been to a flash mob? Yeah? And? What was it about? It was awesome. It was awesome. <laughs> I wandered into one by accident. We were in Philadelphia during the Christmas season, and I wandered in because I heard this incredible organ music. Um, and I was just going to hear the organ music. And it happened to be the flash mob during Philadelphia that day, which was just absolutely stunning. But this concept of flash mob is morphing. In the very beginning, it was this whole idea. Some folks got together, called a whole bunch of people together to come to a place to do a particular act, event, stunt, whatever they were going to do. But it was just supposed to bring joy to people. That was the whole idea. And so musical performances and dance performances were a lot of, a lot of the beginning ones, which were incredible. It's beginning to morph now to this whole concept of um, flashing people virtually. As a matter of fact, the White House today is hosting this um, flash mob 
an online flash mob on gun control. And they're using Twitter and Facebook and all the other methodologies to try and bring everybody together at one moment, uh, sort of in community on the web, to express their opinion about gun control, pro or con. So they then have that sort of huge uh, welling up of voices in the negotiations that are going on between the White House and Congress on gun control. As far as I know, this is the first time it's been done this way uh, through a political office, which is very exciting. The um, second one here is about uh, Idaho, the International Day Against Homophobia and Transphobia, which is the 17th of May. If you're planning to do some kind of event or celebration or work at your local faith communities, and they're doing a worldwide uh, sort of sign-on flash mob around uh, people who have uh, died from hate crimes to memorialize them. And I encourage you to go to the Idaho site, and, and if you don't do anything else, sign up to be one of the people that's uh, part of that. They're also encouraging people to do this type of activity at their local community level. Now, how do you do one of these? You know, if you wanted to do a flash mob, what on earth would you do? How would you put one together? Let's talk about this town right here, and let's choose. My system just died. Sorry, guys. Dead. Ann Arbor. Let's let's just create one here in the room for, for just this moment. Okay. What is one of the worst things you're facing within the LGBT community in Ann Arbor? I just have to say we're in Ypsilanti right now. Oh, sorry. Where am I? <laughs> <laughs> we're in Ypsilanti. Ypsilanti? Yes. Forgive me. Where was I last night? Ann Arbor. Oh. <laughs> I think we could say Ann Arbor, Ypsilanti area. Okay. I bet there's a little competition. There's not. Everybody's, Everybody's all together. I got it. Okay. Ypsilanti. Forgive me. Let's do one right now. What is one of the most difficult, intractable issues facing the LGBT community in Ypsilanti? Everything's good here? No? What is one? Same-sex marriage, illegal. Same-sex marriage is illegal. It is not legal in Ypsilanti yeah, or in Michigan. Michigan. In Michigan, yeah. okay. Another? I, need to add, um, I live in northern Michigan, and the Little Traverse Bay Band of Wadawa Indians just recently passed the gay marriage law within their community. Um, I'm Keweenaw Bay, Indian community in the upper peninsula of Michigan. I've been living in Little River in Manistee, and I'm kind of bringing a different perspective because of the rural reservation, remote perspective. Um, that would be something to organize because, believe it or not, these so-called conservative towns in northern Michigan do have progressives, and they do organize, and they do an amazing job. Um, so that would be one community to pick, Petoskey, which has a tribe there, which has that law. So it's the third tribe in the nation. You can get, you know, to pass this law. So, and Petoskey is, is more of a conservative, you know, community. Emmett County is very conservative. So that would be a place to organize because you're dealing with different dynamics. Down here, it's the urban. Right, <laughs> It's right. the liberal, you know. But that's up there, it's, it's a little bit more challenging. So that would be a good place. So they have done flash mobs up there for, I don't know, more in the Native community, um, right. at the mall in Traverse City. Um, we have another one in Manistee, Manistee but <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that's just an example. When they did the one in the mall, what did they do? Um, well, we organized basically through Facebook, and just our communities are so small, the word gets, I mean, our community, the Native community is so small, the word gets out. Out. Right. So we can get together pretty quick. People came from basically all of Northwest Michigan to the mall, and they organized. And just the flash mob, we had just, um, singing, there was drumming, okay. and dancing. You know, just like round dance. Basically, the round dance is right. we're all going in a circle together. Right. So, and how yeah. many people stopped to see? Um, well, I think there was about eighty so folks in the from the native community. Then you had people from the Grand Traverse region basically kind of come to the mall. I don't know if anybody heard about that, but. Oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, yeah. Cool. Just Very cool. A different perspective.
expected. <laughs> okay, let's do one more. There's no second parent adoption in Michigan. No second parent adoption in Michigan. Okay, so this is our issue. This is the thing we want to have dialogue with people about and we want them to see something about. Okay, now just thinking about children, all right, one of the things that really attracts the public is children singing or performing at almost anything. Singing, dancing, doesn't matter, painting. Most well-meaning folks, regardless of their beliefs about LGBT stuff, like to watch children perform. So, one of the cool things that I saw on an adoption thing in Florida is they actually gathered a children's choir, a children's performance choir. They had 100 children who all assembled simultaneously. They had a particular song which happened to be patriotic. I'm sure there was some choice in that. And uh, some other musicians who were backing them up in doing this. And it was the Christmas season, right? So, perfect. There was nobody there. This was also a mall, by the way. Um, nobody there aware that anything was going to happen. Suddenly, the 100 children assemble. They assemble with the music. They sing one patriotic song, and then they sing, guess what? Jesus loves me. No. Yeah. Someone said it, I think. Silent Night? They sang Silent Night and did the hand, the American Sign Language for Silent Night. People were weeping, all right? Then what do they do afterwards? The folks step out, they have their signs, they put them up. My mommy and mommy should be able to adopt me, all right? Powerful, powerful, right? That's just a quick example of one that could be done. <clears throat> the truth is, there's no, there, there are no rules other than don't get arrested or um, hurt somebody. They are getting some resistance now to doing these in railroad stations because it, it disrupts traffic. So if I were gonna do it at a mall, I would call the mall manager ahead of time Say, I'm going to increase traffic to your mall today by 30%. <laughs> okay? You might want to consider telling all the store owners that they're going to have a lot more traffic. And if they're really into this, they might want to put a little sign in their window that says, Welcome, flash mobbers. Whatever you can do to ease the waters, that would be the way I would do that. Now, you may be saying, well, I, you know, I can't even imagine myself doing something like that? Or who would put that together? Or if we were going to do it, how would we know what to do? Well, the good news is there are actually a set of instructions uh, for doing flash mobs that are very well developed. There is even a company now that will host your flash mob. <laughs> if, uh, you know, this is America, land of the uh, entitled and free. But the... Um, <coughs> If you are interested in reading some more about it, there's a great book called Smart Mobs, The Next Social Revolution that you might find very interesting. It's by Howard Rheingold. It's not new and all the concepts still apply, which is great. And um, if you want to know just a little bit about how to organize from scratch, I have this handout and if your uh, host here for this event wants to, they can copy that and distribute that to you. It just takes you through it step by step. To be successful, don't think about what message you want to deliver. Think about what will people stop to see. What attracts people in your local community? What do people want to see? I lived in uh, Minneapolis once, and I was stunned at the amount of attention that was given to the painting of decoy ducks. I, I didn't know what a decoy duck was. I was from West Texas. And I got up there and there were decoy duck painting contest and the best decoy duck duck of the year contest. I didn't, I didn't get this. But I did discover if someone set up a decoy duck painting booth anywhere, 
here came the Minnesotans. I mean, just, it was just like, you know, we have to see this. And so if I were in Minnesota and I were being creative about a flash mob, you know, I'd probably invite the number one duck decoy painting guy or woman. Or a woman, I don't know, or not, I don't know what they are there. But I'd invite that person and I'd set up a pop up shop, right? Maybe in the mall, one of those kiosks that I could get cheap for a month. And I'd bring that person and I'd get a whole bunch of LGBT people to pretend to be duck decoy painting <laughs> people, even if they weren't. <laughs> teach them how to talk about it, and then I'd probably on the bottom of every decoy duck, I'd have a little message painted that when they picked it up to look at the bottom, because I discovered it's not just the top of the duck that has to be painted right, the bottom has to be right as well, and the test of a true de duck decoy painter is the pin feathers. So they turn them over. So when they turn them over, what could our message be? My mommy should be entitled to adopt me in the state of Minnesota, right? It's that simple. I thank you for your time today, and I look forward to seeing some of you in the workshop this afternoon. You're very cool to be doing what you're doing, and we're grateful.